they asked me in LA if uh, I wanted it to be recorded, I said, well, if Not you here want, we record all our all seminars. Yeah, all seminars. And then you put them on the web? Or yeah, or we put them on the web. Uh, okay. Uh, hi, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. And I, again, I apologize for the uh, last minute change. Uh, this uh, uh, seminar is, of course, offered jointly with the IEEE Signal Processing Society chapter. And uh, it's a pleasure to have here today Dr. Abdelhaq Zubir from Technical Technische Universität Darmstadt in Germany. Dr. Zubil is uh, a fellow of the IEEE, and IEEE, of course, a distinguished lecturer, uh, of course, which he's visiting us as today. He received his uh, doctor in engineering from Ruhr University of uh, Bochum in Germany in 1992. He was with Queensland University of Technology in Austra uh, Australia from 92 to 10, in 98, where he was associate professor. In 1999, he joined uh, Curtin University of Technology Australia as a professor of telecommunication and was also interim head of the School of Electrical Engineering from 2001 to 2003. In 2003, he moved to uh, the Technische Universität of Darmstadt, Germany, as a professor and head of the signal processing group. His research interest is in statistical signal processing with uh, 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 with emphasis on bootstrap techniques for buzz detection estimation and array processing for applications in telecommunications, radar, sonar, and car engine monitoring and biomedicine. He published over 300 journal and conference papers in the related areas. He has co-authored a book on uh, bootstrap techniques for signal processing published by Cambridge University. And he was also guest co-editor of a special issue on the bootstrap and an application in the IEEE Signal Processing Magazine in 2007. Dr. Zubir co-authored the paper uh, on detection of sources using bootstrap techniques that received the 2003 Young SPS, uh, SPS Young Author Award from uh, uh, the Signal Processing Society. He continues to serve on the editorial board of the Signal Processing Society. He's actually uh, uh, right now the chair of uh, the uh, signal processing techniques and methods. And uh, he's also uh, the, uh, uh, he was the general chair, technical chair, and member of the technical uh, committees and numerous conferences, IEEE conferences and uh, workshops. It's a pleasure to have him here to, uh, talking to us about some spectral uh, bootstrap methods for of frequency domain, the bootstrap methods for spectral analysis. It's a pleasure to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hamid, uh, for the kind words. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you to Joe, who is uh, absent today, for inviting me too. And it's a pleasure to be here, indeed. So I would like to talk about frequency domain bootstrap methods for spectral analysis. And uh, therefore, I would like to start with uh, a brief motivation as to why we would like to look into spectral analysis. So spectral analysis has been around for uh, uh, more than a century. And uh, the first works uh, date back to uh, Schuster in 1894, when he came up with the concept of a periodogram, okay, which uh, is well known. And there are many reasons for using spectral analysis in real life. Uh, it does uh, provide useful, uh, useful descriptive statistics. Uh, it's also a diagnostic tool uh, to uh, indicate uh, which further analysis might be relevant, say filtering or estimation or detection. And also, it's uh, important uh, to check postulated theoretical models. And I'll, I'll give some examples later on with real uh, life data. Now. Uh, Spectral analysis is a fundamental tool, is uh, now firmly involved in various areas of electrical engineering, uh, such as uh, radar and sonar and communication. But well, what's uh, the focus today? Today, uh, my focus is not to come up with a new estimator for spectral uh, for densities, but it's, it's uh, more about statistical inference. And we're going to use the bootstrap for statistical inference. And statistical inference for spectra and functions of spectra, such as the coherence function or the transfer function, uh, have been uh, a subject of interest in many areas of electrical engineering and elsewhere, too. 
And there are techniques for statistical inference, but these ones, as I will uh, discuss in a minute, rely on uh, asymptotic theory. So let me briefly show you uh, the basic concept of uh, a spectrum estimator. Suppose that we have uh, a time series xt or a signal xt, uh, discrete time, real valued, and it's strictly stationary with the covariance function, which is bounded. And we define the spectrum uh, via the wiener chin, chin theorem as the Fourier transform of the covariance function. So now given observations x1 to xt, we would like to estimate the spectrum. We would like to estimate cxx of omega, but also we would like to give some kind of measure of accuracy of our estimator. So uh, for example, here a confidence interval for cxx of omega. Now, the uh, very first ideas about uh, a spectrum estimation are based on the periodogram, as I mentioned, Schuster. So the periodogram is simply the finite Fourier transform magnitude squared divided by the number of samples. Okay? And what you do to make it a, a stable estimator, you smooth over frequencies, or you can average data stretches, uh, as the Welsh uh, spectrum as you know all. Um, now, this is a simple smoothing operation of the periodogram over frequencies with the kernel function. Okay? So if you take this estimator, then um, you'll, you'll get uh, results uh, as such. So uh, the blue curve is the true spectrum, unknown. Or can you uh, assume that you have some observations? Say here, 256 data points, and we take a bandwidth for the Bartlett Priestley kernel function of 0.1, then you get the periodogram uh, in red, dotted red, and a smoothed periodogram in green, as you can see. Okay, so you have you try to estimate uh, the blue curve. This is uh, what estimation is about. But the the point, the, the focus of my talk today is about uh, accuracy measures such as confidence intervals. Okay, so you could assume um, that asymptotically for large t, number of observations, that your spectral estimator is a scaled chi-square random variable with 4m plus 2 degrees of freedom, whereby m is uh, dependent on the sample size and the bandwidth of the kernel. Okay? And then you can deduce a confidence interval. And the confidence interval is given as such so that you say your unknown spectrum of interest is between two bounds which depend on the spectral estimator and a number uh, x squared of 1 minus alpha on 2. Alpha is given, so the confidence interval is 1 minus alpha times 100%. Okay, and so you could construct a confidence interval. And what, what you get in doing so is uh, what you have here left and right. On the left hand side you have an AR process of fifth order with Gaussian innovations, and you can see that, uh, so in, in dotted line, you find this is the estimator. The true spectrum is the black, and you see that the true spectrum crosses the bounds. Okay, so there is something wrong here, uh, something that is not um, uh, admissible or desired. On the right-hand side, we have uh, an AR process. Again, not a regressive process, but the innovations are uniformly distributed. Okay, and so we deviate more from the Gaussian distribution, and we get similarly some some bounds, and uh, the true spectrum is outside those bounds, in fact. Okay, which is something it's it's a problem, and we want to solve this problem. Uh, so what we did uh, so far, we assumed that we have a large number of data points, so that we could assume that the spectral estimates at uh, distinct frequencies are independently and identically distributed as chi-square random variables. Um, but the problem is uh, this assumption of large t uh, fails in practice. And it fails because sometimes uh, you don't have a chance to uh, remeasure the data or rerun the experiment. Okay? And sometimes because you have instationalities and you want to apply stationarity methods, so you restrict yourself to a short sample size. So the, uh, the objective here is to find a confidence interval for the spectral density based on 
uh, minimal assumptions and when you have a data size that is small. So bootstrap techniques are an alternative tool to asymptotic theory, especially when you don't know the distribution of your data and you have a short segment. This is to motivate uh, the use of the bootstrap and uh, now I'd like to give you a uh, brief uh, uh, content of uh, my talk. So I would like to first uh, answer the question, what can I use the bootstrap for? Then uh, how does the bootstrap work, the history of it? Uh, then move on to the independent data bootstrap, give you an example of independent data resampling. Then I'll give you an example of independent data resampling for dependent data, okay? And uh, discuss uh, some blocking techniques of the bootstrap, uh, such as the moving blocks bootstrap and some variants of it. Then I'll move on to the frequency domain bootstrap and uh, uh, tell you, uh, give you a brief introduction to two methods, the multiplicative re regression technique and the autoregressive added periodogram bootstrap. So I have two real life examples uh, that I can show you. Uh, if time permits, I'll show you both. Uh, otherwise, I'll uh, discuss only the confidence bounds for spectra of combustion engine knock data. Okay, and I'll explain what that means later on. Okay, so often the bootstrap is associ associated with the tail of the Baron von Munchausen. The Baron von Munchausen, the tail states that the Baron von Munchausen was riding his horse and he got stuck in the mud. And when he got stuck in the mud, he pulled himself up by the bootstrap, right? This is the, the tail. So uh, this association is uh, frequently done in the, in the literature, but this is a, a misleading association because it suggests that uh, the bootstrap can do the impossible, right? Which is not true. The bootstrap is merely uh, a technique that is useful which substitutes analytical derivation by computer simulations, okay? And it solves uh, inferential problems, but not all of them, obviously. And uh, this is why uh, I, I don't really like this association with uh, the Baron von Munchausen. By the way, this uh, drawing was done by a colleague of mine in the maths department. And he's a very talented person. But he never lived to tell the tale. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. OK, so uh, now, of course, the bootstrap works in many, many situations. But there are situations where uh, it fails. Well, what can I use it for? I mean, the bootstrap is not an estimation technique. Indeed, it's an estimation technique of characteristics of estimators, but it doesn't provide you with an estimator, OK? So the bootstrap is a computational tool for statistical inference. It can uh, estimate bias, variance, distribution functions, and therefore confidence intervals. It can be used for hypothesis testing, in particular for our application of signal detection. It's very important can be used for model selection, okay? When you want to estimate the number of signals in impinging on an array, for example, you could uh, use the bootstrap. And I can use the bootstrap when I know very little about my statistics uh, of the data and I have uh, only a uh, limited amount of uh, observations. Now, let me now explain the idea of the bootstrap. What is uh, the idea? So here we have a situation where this is the real world on the left-hand side. So you have some unknown probability model, okay? This is the population uh, distribution. And you draw a sample. And you have uh, a set of observations, x1 to xn, right? And you are interested in estimating an unknown of f, say the mean, for example, of f, right? Based on x1 to xn. So what you do, you take the average value, you have a sample mean. Now what you want to do is to answer the question, what's the distribution of that sample mean? Not knowing f, right? That's the statistic theta hat is equal s of x is not of central interest, but the distribution of theta hat is of interest to us. Now, if we knew f, right, we could maybe derive some characteristics of theta hat, okay? But if we don't know uh, f, then we could using asymptotic arguments that the sample mean may be Gaussian, right? Now, the idea of the bootstrap is the following. Based on the data, x1 to xn, estimate f hat, the so-called empirical distribution function, 
right? And we know, according to Glivenko Cantelli lemma, that f hat converges with probability 1 towards f, right? So this is a, a good start. And because we have f hat, we can generate data from f hat, right? Okay, as many as we wanted. We don't need to repeat the experiment, so we have the data at hand and we can generate new data, the so-called pseudo data, right? And then we calculate the estimate, right? In the same way we did it with the original data. So we get what we call theta hat star. So it will be sample mean, not as good as this one, right? But it will be sample mean, right? And because f hat converges to f, and assuming that s is a smooth function of the data, then you can say that the characteristics of theta hat star converge the statistical characteristics to those of theta hat. That's the idea of the bootstrap. Okay? In distribution. Yes. In distribution. Yes. yes. Well, so uh, history, what, what does it come from? Okay, I told you about the name, where it comes from. Okay? But, uh, but Efron, in 1979, he was the one who <coughs> basically uh, merged the Monte Carlo approximation with inferential statistics and came up with a methodology how to do it. But arguably, the prehistory of the bootstrap goes before 1979. In, in India, in the 20s, um, special sampling was used, and concepts such as the bootstrap were basically used without giving it a name, right? Malanobis did some work there. And even those were before Canoe, who invented the jackknife, which is a similar thing uh, as the bootstrap. Okay, now I would like to emphasize um, this creation of pseudo data, how we do it, okay, because it's very important to understand how we generate bootstrap samples, right? the ones I showed you on the right hand side of the figure previously. Suppose that you conduct an experiment, you get a set of data x1 to xn. And uh, so you find an estimator theta hat, and you would like to ask yourself, OK, what is the, uh, or you want to answer the question, what's the distribution of theta hat? So what we do first, we construct the empirical distribution. And I'll explain that we don't need to do it explicitly in a minute, because the data itself constitutes my f hat, my empirical distribution. OK? So you could uh, take the histogram of the data, so that gives you uh, a rough estimate of uh, your uh, density. And then uh, from the selected f hat, which you have uh, gained from your data, you can draw what we call a bootstrap sample or a resample, x1 star, x2 star, up to xn star. And then what you do is you approximate the distribution of theta hat by the distribution of theta hat star, which is derived from the bootstrap observations or pseudo uh, observations. Now, I would like to show the algorithm how to do it, OK? Because we, I said earlier that we use uh, computations to derive statistics for um, uh, an estimator, a given estimator. And this is the algorithm, OK? So the idea here is that if I use f hat, I don't need to run the experiment again, OK? I should be able to create as many bootstrap samples as I wanted. And the more I do, okay, the more I could, the more likely I can get some information about inference, about statistics of my estimator. So we run the experiment, we get some data x, we compute the statistic, we have theta hat, we resample. And I'm going to explain how we resample in a minute. Uh, then what we do when we resample, we get, uh, so bootstrap data, pseudo data. And what we then do is calculate the statistic of interest. If this is the sample mean, we calculate the sample mean based on x star, right? Same way as we did it with the original data, OK? So then we resample again and again and again and again from the original data. See, this is a as if I've constructed f hat and I have drawn from f hat. Or I draw from the data with replacement Randomly, I do the same thing, all right? Once I have those statistics, those estimates, right? I can estimate the distribution function of them, right? How they, they are distributed. And this is an approximation of the distribution of theta hat. 
So resampling IID data is uh, depicted here. Okay. Imagine you have a box with six balls. You have six different colors. Well, in IID, identically independently distributed data, so you draw at random with replacement to create a resample of the same size as the original data, which means that if you did it, right, you may have repeats. So you have on the right-hand side, okay, a case where the green color doesn't appear, right, but the pink color appears twice. Right? You could do it again, so the yellow ball doesn't appear, but you have two red balls, and so on and so forth. You may have three, okay, so triples, right? and two colors would be missing. Right? This is independent data resampling. That's what we do. So we take at random okay, a sample with replacement. So you may have repeats, and some samples don't appear at all. That is not important for us because we are not after a good estimate. We are after some statistical inference. Okay? So the estimate, if you took the average, if these are numbers, you took the average, so the best average, the most accurate average would be this one because you have six independent numbers. Right? Here you have less. You are using one twice, and here you have three. So, but that doesn't matter because we are not after a good estimate. We have it already. So we are after a distribution. So we are extracting information by resampling. That's the idea. OK? So let me give you an example of variance estimation. Suppose that I have a data set x1 to xn from some unknown distribution, f theta. And I'm, I'm interested in the variance of theta hat, theta hat being an estimator drawn from x1 to xn. Suppose that your theta is the mean of f. Okay, So you take the sample mean. Now, if you knew that your data stems from the Gaussian distribution, then the variance of mu hat is given by sigma squared divided by n. This is when known a result. The question is, what happens if I don't know the distribution of the data and the size n is small, where I cannot apply asymptotic theory? So here I could use the bootstrap to answer the question. What I do is basically I have my original data. I resample. So I get to resample x1 star, x2 star, up to xb star. Right? Each time I calculate the estimate of my parameter, which is in this case mu. Right? So I have number b of estimates. Right? So the best estimate is, of course, the one that I have generated from x1 to xn. Right? And then what I do is I simply take the equation of a sample variance. So this is nothing but the sample variance okay, based on mu i star. Okay? And this would approximate the variance of mu hat, okay? mu hat being the estimate from the original data. Now, in signal processing, we we deal with dependent data. We don't have always IID data, and this is uh, this we don't have uh, usually this luxury. Okay, so the question is, how do I proceed in the case where I have dependent data? I cannot do this resampling drawing at random with replacement, right? Okay, so there are two ways of doing this. Okay, so. Um, OK, the assumption of ID data can break down, of course, in practice, either because the data is not independent or because it is non-identically distributed, either or both. So we could, we could still invoke the bootstrap if we knew a model for our data, the correlated data, but I know the model. For example, if I knew that the data is well represented by an autoregressive process. And I'll show an example why. So, if I knew that, right, I could use the innovation of the process okay, to do independent data resampling. Why? Suppose that my data can be represented by an autoregressive process of first order. Okay, so you have xt plus a times uh, xt minus 1 is equal to zt. zt right, is iid okay, by definition. Right? So if it's by IID is what I could do. I could estimate A, construct 
residual zt hat, right? Okay? And then resample and then create new dependent bootstrap data. Right? So first, if I assumed that zt is Gaussian, right, I could take uh, the maximum likelihood estimate, which is simply the ratio of uh, sample covariance at uh, leg 1 is 0, the negative sign. This is the maximum likelihood estimate, but also the your worker equation solution, right? And I know that the variance, which I'm interested in, the variance of a hat of the estimator, of this estimator, can be approximated for large t by this expression. Okay? I want to find a bootstrap estimate okay, for sigma square of a hat. Okay? What's the variance of a hat? Okay? I could use the same estimator okay, for my a, could use the Euler Walker equation and solve for that, but how would I do this? Well, it's, uh, it's not very difficult. So first I estimate a. I get a hat. When I get, get a hat, I calculate the residuals. So I note the residuals. See here, the data goes from 0 to t minus 1. But the residuals, they go from 1 to t minus 1. Why? Because I have a delay there. So I cannot, cannot st start at 0. So I calculate z t only for 1 to t minus 1. That's not the problem. Then what I do is I do resampling as I did before for independent data because I know they should be, they are supposedly independent. Okay? So once, once I have done that, I take the original estimate, a hat, and reconstruct. How do I reconstruct? So I reconstruct by writing xt star is minus a hat, x star t minus 1 plus the resampled residual. But of course, I don't have the x star 0. But that's not a problem. I take the original value for that. So if I had an AR process of second order, I would have two missing values. I do not have to create pseudo data. I just use the original data. We're done. Then I have a new bootstrap time series, bootstrap AR process, and I calculate the estimate again from that series, and I do it. I do it several times, and when I get many of those, I can simply calculate the variance. That's the idea here. So you, you take a model, calculate the residuals, which you assume are independent. You resample those, reconstruct your signal, get a pseudo signal, okay, and then do the estimation, and you get a new bootstrap estimate, and so on and so forth. And this is, this is what you get. So if uh, we take... Um, for com comparison purposes, the Gaussian process, uh, maximum likelihood is about minus 0 0.6351 uh, for an original A of minus 0 0.6. I have 128 data points. So the, uh, sigma, the, the sigma based on the maximum likelihood is uh, 0 0.070. The bootstrap one is 0 0.0712. And if you do Monte Carlo simulations over several times, you get uh, standard deviation of 0 0.0694. Okay. Now, this is when you know a model, but not in all cases you have a model, right? So you, you cannot assume that your data stems from an autoregressive process. What would you do? Well, uh, you may have to make some assumption, and one of the assumptions is uh, strong mixing, or you say that your data is weakly dependent. Strong mixing, loosely speaking, means that data far apart are nearly independent. Okay? So when the covariance function decays fast, for example. Okay? So here we have uh, a method, a technique that we could apply. This is called the moving blocks bootstrap. Okay? And there are variations of it, uh, circular block bootstrap. I'll, I'll mention this in a minute. Suppose that I have a time series like this. I don't know if it's an autoregressive process or anything. Right? So what I do is I decide about the block size. Okay? So in this example, I have 100 data points. I decide that I take a block of 20 samples. So I take at random a block. Say I pick number 1. Okay? So when I pick this number 1 here, okay, 
I do another resampling. I pick at random another block, which is number two, okay, in blue, right? And then I do it because I have blocks of 20 and the total size is 100. I can take only five blocks, right? Well, then I concatenate one, two, three, four, and five, and I declare that I have a time series, a new bootstrap time series, okay? of 100 samples, right? And this looks like this, right? And I can do it again. So I take again at random and so on. So this is the so-called moving blocks bootstrap. There are variations of it, the circular block bootstrap where you wrap around the end to the, to the start so that you, you can pick at any, any placement, okay? The stationary block bootstrap where you take random sizes and the taper block bootstrap where you taper the blocks and there are other ones as well. So now, uh, this brings me to the frequency domain bootstrap methods for dependent data, and this is uh, something important that uh, we need to go back to. So I wanted just to give a flavor of how to resample, how to create bootstrap samples. Okay, now, we know how to do it in the time domain. So what we could do for our spectral analysis, we could do a moving blocks bootstrap, and each time when we generate a new signal, we calculate the periodogram and then the spectral estimate, and we do it again and again and again. So, but we'll have to go back and forth between time domain and frequency domain, right? But it, it would answer our question, okay? We'll have a solution to that. But there are techniques that are based on bootstrapping directly in the frequency domain, okay? So, I mentioned already in the motivation the importance of uh, uh, estimating um, confidence intervals for spectral density. And there are two approaches, as I just mentioned. You could use a time domain approach, like a blocking technique, to bootstrap time series, and then estimate the spectral density estimates from time series replica, and so on, and go on and on. Or you use a technique that applies directly in the frequency domain. OK? Now, let me go back to the very first slide. This is the very first slide. It, so we have. Uh, a time series or a signal xt, real value strictly stationary with a representation xt, which is a filtered version of some innovation. I do this because I want to uh, state some theoretical results. I assume that xt is a linear process, stable, filtered, white noise. Okay? So the periodogram is defined as such, and I have then a smoothed periodogram as my spectral. Uh, estimate. Now, we know, you did the graduate course, I'm sure you, uh, ha you know that the, the periodogram has, has an expected value which is approximately the same as the spectral density, but its variance is the square of the spectrum. So this is why it's not a suitable estimator, okay? But what's important is this expression of the covariance of Ix x of omega j and omega k, so two neighboring frequencies. There is, indeed, some kind of correlation between the ordinates of the periodogram, okay? And these, or this correlation depends on eta 4, which is the fourth order cumulant of the innovation process epsilon t and uh, the uh, square of the variance of epsilon t, okay? So this is a known result. So based on this, you can write the periodogram as spectral density times the periodogram of the innovation, which you don't know. You don't have access to that. It's just a model divided by the variance of the innovation plus an error term, okay? RT of omega k. Now, if you would ignore, suppose that I would ignore RT, okay? Suppose this is unknown, okay? Then what I have is a relationship between the periodogram and the spectral density in a multiplicative regression. So I call these errors. So I call them epsilon k, right? Or uk, whatever. So what we could do is we write the errors as a ratio between the periodogram and the spectral density, okay? Now, I don't have the spectral density, right? So what I could do is I estimate the spectral density. So I can write a relationship between those errors, 
okay, the periodogram and the spectral density. Now I know, asymptotically at least, right, that those frequencies are nearly independent, or the ordinates of the periodogram are nearly independent. So what I could do, I could do independent data resampling of those errors, the epsilon k, this term. So I try to mimic, with the bootstrap, this behavior. Okay, but I don't have the unknown. So I replace it by a good estimator, okay? And this is the idea of the so-called residual-based bootstrap. So what you do is the following. So you have your data, x. You calculate your periodogram at frequency omega k. Then you smooth, you have an original estimator based on the original data. But then you calculate the ratio between the periodogram and the spectral density estimator. Okay? These are the errors I mentioned before. And these are IID errors, approximately for large t. Okay? I know I motivated the bootstrap for small sample sizes, but let me do as if I have a sufficiently large t and I simply resample. Uh, so I resample with replacement, okay? at random with replacement. So I get a new bootstrap error here. So with this bootstrap error, I multiply with the original spectral estimator, I get a bootstrap periodogram. So I take the bootstrap periodogram, I smooth it, I get a bootstrap spectral density estimate. Okay? So I can do this many times, and I have several spectral density estimates. When I have those, I can estimate the distribution, and I can estimate the confidence interval. Okay, based on my original data. Okay, I made a slight assumption that I could resample those errors, okay, but at least it gives me, uh, it's not as strong as the other one. And you can show mathematically, based on some regularity conditions, that the Malo distance, this is distance between the two distributions of the bootstrap statistic and the original statistic, goes to zero in probability, okay? So this works as uh, the convergence result shows. Now there is a limitation with this technique. Uh, the technique assumes independence, the periodogram ordinates, which is justified uh, asymptotically. Um, but there is a weak dependence we know of, and I, I showed you this with the eta 4. So you could go and estimate the eta 4 the uh, courtesies and, uh, and uh, maybe correct for that and, and, or take it into account in a bootstrap procedure. But this is very difficult to achieve. Um, so to find a non-parametric estimate is, is quite difficult. So Kreis and Paparoditis in the year 2003 came up with a, a great idea actually. So combine a time domain technique with a frequency domain technique Okay, to capture this dependence, okay, so we use a parametric fit in the time domain to generate periodogram ordinates that imitate those features okay, of the dependence in the periodogram domain. Okay? While a non-parametric kernel-based correction in the frequency domain catches simply the features which are not represented in the parametric fit. So you combine, you go back and forth, time domain and frequency domain, and you get better results. Now, this is the idea that was suggested. It's very simple. You remember this. It used to be C of omega k here, right? Now we have written a spectral function Q of omega times an autoregressive spectrum. This is, this autoregressive spectrum is used to pick this weak dependence I mentioned before. So what we do is basically we estimate this Q. This is the estimate of this Q is very simple. Uh, the CAR is, hat, is obtained via a fit, an autoregressive fit, okay? And then we could gain some bootstrap periodograms. And this method works much better. Now you could argue why an AR if my data is not autoregressive? No, any other model would do. 
okay? So the moving average or an ARMA process would do, but it has to be a linear process. Let me give you some results, simulation results first, right? So here we consider a process XT and the data size of 256. We use a uniform distribution uh, of the innovation, okay? And here I have some results for estimating a 95% confidence interval. These are frequency bins, right? Well, are collected uh, carefully. Um, RSD is for the residual uh, based method. TBB is a time domain method, the taper block bootstrap, where you go back and forth time domain, you resample, and then you calculate the spectrum and you, and so on and so forth. This one here is simply resampling residuals, knowing that you have an AR model. Knowing that you have an AR model, you resample residuals, and then you do, again, back and forth. And this is the autoregressive added uh, periodogram technique. You can see this fails. And there are reasons uh, for that. You can explain that. This is pretty robust, and it works pretty well, although we made the assumption that the uh, periodogram ordinates are nearly independent. Okay, the autoregressive one is performed similarly to the residual based method, and you can see that the newly developed method is, is quite robust and is very close to the 95% of the nominal. These results were obtained over 1,000 Monte Carlo runs. Okay, so there are other techniques in the frequency domain, but I don't want to go into that. So I would like to show you some real life example. Okay, uh, the first one is on knock detection. Well, uh, especially in Europe, uh, we uh, try to build high compression engines. Okay, it's high compression engines. When you build high compression engines, uh, you have a tendency uh, to have knock occurring at high speed. Right? And um, the problem with that is uh, that you can damage your engine very, very quickly. Okay, and uh, you have uh, a loss of efficiency. So the attempt has been and is always uh, uh, valid trying to improve upon systems that have been built over the last two decades. Try to detect knock and then correct the spark timing. What is knock? So once you have a spark that originates from the spark plug. Okay, so the gas mixture in the combustion chamber starts burning, and somewhere in this gas uh, mixture that is unburned, a critical state is reached, and there is an auto ignition. So you have two ignitions in one combustion cycle. Okay, and these ones, these auto ignitions, generate shock waves, and these shock waves are very damaging to the piston. Okay, and in high speed, at high speed, you do not, you do not hear them, you don't hear knock, you hear it at low speed, okay? So, so how do you solve this problem? The, the problem, okay, is once you detect it, you have to detect knock, right? You correct the spark timing, right? Of course, when you correct the spark timing, you go into safe mode, and when you go into safe mode, you decrease efficiency. Okay, so the, the objective is to try to run your engine at high efficiency while avoiding knock. So control systems built in, in in modern cars try to detect knock, correct the spark timing, and try to run as safe as possible. Okay? But what we use are the so-called vibration sensors, accelerometers, that are placed on the engine block. Right? Um, we have data here which we measured at uh, Bosch in Stuttgart, uh, sampled at 100 kilohertz, and I'll explain why. Okay, uh, forget about this one. This is just to show you the analogy between uh, detection and confidence interval estimation. So I'll show you results only uh, about confidence interval uh, estimation as I di discussed it earlier. This is an in-cylinder pressure, high-pass filter, of a knocking combustion cycle. So you don't have the expansion curve where the pressure rises. You take only the high pass filter uh, signal because this is what indicates if a combustion is knocking or not. So in the high frequency domain, not in the low frequency. 
Okay. So this you can, uh, you can measure in a test bed because in a test bed you are able to drill in the uh, cylinder block or cylinder head, okay, and put a pressure sensor so you are in the vicinity of the combustion chamber so you can collect measurements of your pressure signal. But in a serial car, you can't do that, okay? But this is a clean signal and is, uh, is easy to detect knock based on cylinder pressure. The challenge is in here. So you have a vibration signal placed on the engine block, so you measure the vibrations. So you have not only the knock signal, but you have also a noise from the gearbox, from the valve train, and other sources of noise. So the challenge is to use a signal like that, one combustion, one combustion cycle, and then detect the knock, and then correct the spark timing. So suppose I have the luxury of having 594 periodograms, 594 cycles. Okay, So I would, I would basically estimate the spectrum by averaging 594 periodograms. Right? This is a very good estimator. Right? Then I know clearly, oh, there are very, very distinct resonance frequencies. And we can explain this physically. Okay? They are, and they are related in position as well. So this is when you look at the insulin pressure. When you look at the vibration signal, so you get a spectrum which is in red. And you can see that the second resonance mode is a little bit weak. Okay? And it's important to detect knock by measuring the power at those frequencies. Okay? So what we could do is apply a technique. And here it's the autoregressive edit periodogram technique uh, to construct confidence intervals. And this is a confidence interval for the spectral density of the insulin pressure. And you can see there is no crossing between the estimated one and uh, the bounds. And you can see the tightness of the bounds, which is a good indication for the quality of the confidence intervals. And this is when you look at, based of course on one cycle. We're talking here about one cycle, right? So I take one cycle and I estimate the confidence interval. Okay, and here again for the vibration signal, and uh, we're quite satisfied with this result. I have another five minutes. Yeah. Okay. Another application: micro Doppler analysis. This is a little bit more complicated. Micro Doppler is a, is a phenomenon that is very important in many physical systems, especially in radar. Okay. So the objective is: I mean, micro Doppler can be. Um, modeled as a frequency modulated signal, okay, but uh, not a, a linear uh, frequency modulation. Uh, it's more complicated than that. So the objective is to estimate the frequency modulate parameters along with the measure of accuracy, such as confidence interval. That's the objective, okay? Suppose that I model my signal, S of t, as an amplitude modulation and a frequency modulation. So I have uh, an amplitude which can be written as a polynomial of order q. Okay? The unknowns are the alpha k. They are not a problem to estimate. Okay? And I have a phase which can be expressed as the ratio of a parameter d okay? divided by the micro Doppler frequency times the cos function. So if I look at the instantaneous frequency, which is the derivative of the phase, it's a sinusoid in the micro Doppler. Okay, with the micro Doppler frequency. So I have three parameters. I have d, omega m, and phi, which are of interest when I analyze micro Doppler. Okay? Now, I don't measure s, but I measure a noisy version of s. So s plus v of t. Right? So the goal is to estimate the parameters d, omega m, and phi, and also some confidence interval for the unknowns. Well, how do we do that? So the estimation, I don't want to talk too much about the estimation, but uh, surely the estimation of the instantaneous frequency has been around for many, several decades. And uh, here we picked a method that is really good, the time frequency half transform, which performs very well in this setting. Okay. Um, the uh, amplitude parameters are are easy to estimate. Once we have estimated the instantaneous frequency, we demodulate, and then we do linear least squares, and then we get the estimates 
for the parameters. So given those parameters, we calculate the residuals. And we found out that the residuals are correlated. And I can show some figures there that uh, it's, uh, it's quite correlated. It's not uh, uh, as simple as that. So I cannot do independent data resampling. So what we did is we fitted the autoregressive process to the residuals to get the residuals of the residuals, resample those, and then reconstruct and then construct confidence intervals. OK? So we have collected data at uh, Villanova, uh, uh, director, uh, sorry, at the Center of Advanced Communications, directed by Professor Moniz Amin, a colleague of ours. And um, so the um, uh, results are based on a carrier frequency of 919 of a radar system that was looking at the pendulum swinging. OK, sampling frequency of 1 kilohertz. So we used the pseudo Wigner-Ville distribution to show the results uh, of this instantaneous frequency. So when you look at the left-hand uh, side, so that's the instantaneous frequency. That's the micro Doppler, so you can see a sinusoid clearly, sinusoid uh, representing the instantaneous frequency. This is the pendulum movement, OK? And on the right-hand side, with uh, a dashed line, we show the estimation of the instantaneous frequency, OK? This is the pseudo wigner ville distribution. And this is once we estimate the instantaneous frequency, we get the dashed white line. OK, so if you look at the data itself and the fit, the amplitude modulation, frequency modulation fit. So that's the, in blue and in red. OK, so you see there is a, a good, a good uh, data fit there. The residuals are given there, the real part and the imaginary part. So you can see the correlation structure, OK, which is uh, quite strong. OK, so we had to whiten the residuals in the real part and the imaginary part, OK? in order to be able to resample independently. We could have taken the moving block bootstrap and simply resampled the residuals, which are correlated. Okay, But we preferred to model this with an autoregressive process and then do the resampling uh, with the independent data. So, And then uh, we have estimates here for D, for the nonlinear parameters, D and omega m. And in blue, you can see the distribution. In red is the estimated value of D. And uh, so this is for both cases. And dashed or dotted lines are the confidence bounds. So you can, you are able to calculate confidence bounds with the bootstrap or estimate confidence bounds with the bootstrap based on measurements. And we have done 500 bootstrap resampling steps. You can imagine that analytically trying to do this analytically for this signal model would be Nearly impossible, very difficult. OK, so this brings me to the end. Uh, like Just to summarize that the bootstrap techniques are very attractive, in particular when you have uh, a small sample size and you cannot apply asymptotic theory uh, to uh, do statistical inference. Uh, and we have uh, shown some good results with the bootstrap, not only micro Doppler and spectral analysis, but there are many many more uh, real data analysis that we have uh, shown where we have shown that the bootstrap is a powerful tool. Um, I haven't discussed everything. Uh, I haven't discussed uh, <coughs> variants of the bootstrap, such as bagging and uh, bumping for classification, and a very important and hot topic at the moment. Model selection with the bootstrap, uh, hypothesis testing, particular for signal detection and Bayesian approaches to the bootstrap, because you can think of a Bayesian approach and bootstrap combined. Okay. Now, you as a signal processing practitioner, you would like to know how would you go about resampling when you have data. You don't know, so you first check if your data is IID. There are techniques how to see if it's nearly IID or not. Then if this is the case, then you go to standard bootstrap resampling technique, as I showed you before. And the rest is straight, straightforward. So if your data is not IID, OK, so you check if you have a model. You can represent your data with an autoregressive process or an ARMA process. And then 
If this is the case, you calculate the residuals. You estimate your parameters, calculate the residuals, you resample the residuals. Okay? And how to resample the residuals? You simply use an independent data bootstrap. Otherwise, you may choose to use a blocking technique, moving blocks bootstrap, and then you get resamples. This brings me to the end. I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Are there any questions? I do have a question. Uh, oh. oh, there's somebody on. Go ahead. Well, I, I want to ask about uh, you're handling the phase as, as well. Uh, do you have any suggestions for phase randomization? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, there is, there is another technique of phase randomization. I mean, there are techniques uh, for phase random randomization. Yeah, I was thinking for, for what? sequence comparison where, where the sequence is fixed and there's an interest in composing a control, control sequence, which seems like a similar problem that I was wondering about implications for, of, say, a secondary bootstrap I know you've of, applied. Of, uh, the discipline, I, sorry, I just was wondering if you had an opinion. Yeah, I mean, uh, surrogate data analysis, I mean, this is uh, yeah, the type of thing, yeah, surrogate yeah, data, yeah, right? So yeah. you do a random, randomize your phase, you get the pseudo, the surrogate data, so to yeah. say, you know, to make some uh, inference analysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean. There'd be ca cautions from? With the phase, I, I mean, I, I'm very careful with the, with the phase because it's uh, usually uniformly distributed between minus pi and pi. What you could do with the phase, you could, could use a parametric bootstrap, mm -hmm. okay? So knowing that it is uniformly distributed but with unknown parameters, I mean, here it's, uh, it's known. So you draw three samples from, uh, from uh, a uniform distribution between zero and two pi, right? Or minus pi and pi. And uh, then you perturb your phase and then you get uh, yeah, so resamples. I mean, you can do that. Yeah, I mean, this is this is uh, assuming more than the bootstrap, right? Mm -hmm. You know your phase, okay? You know you have a phase, and you do that. I mean, I, there has been some applications where, where it has been very successful. So look at data analysis. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you, are you dealing with this? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And you use uh, surrogate data, right? Uh, so you, you, you perturbate the phase and you get some right. pseudo data, and then you do statistical inference, is it? Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. bioinformatics. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I haven't done it, but it's, it's quite common, yeah. This is, uh, and it's just a different community, right? I mean, they, they use this uh, quite heavily, then, the bootstrap community, yeah? but it, it, it seems to be successful, I mean, working well for, for those type of problems, yeah. Because here, I mean, I, I had this omega M and D. I mean, I, I mean if I perturbated the phase, uh, I, 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 needed, I needed to come back and, and estimate those parameters, oh, yeah. I, right? Yeah. I mean, that's why I didn't use an approach oh, like right. that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Now, can you imagine, for instance, uh, something that's adaptive? In other words, you, now you, you started out with an assumption that, uh, you know, that of course your data is limited, or, or you know, uh, at least you're dealing with uh, uh, short samples. And and then, is there a, a way to perhaps one can imagine sort of a, a recursive way of coming back? You know, you get you get your estimate, and you're not so happy with it, right? And then you you update. You get more data. Yeah, you get yeah, more you, data. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if, you, if I have more is, data. Are there such uh, techniques, adaptive techniques for that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, so you can if, if you have the possibility, the I mean, fly. on the fly, here I have a batch of data, right? And this is all I have, not more, okay? So based on N, on this sample size, okay, I try to extract information. Now, what you are talking about is actually adding more, right. increasing my n, so it gets better. But then the question arises, at what time should I uh, stop because it becomes right. not feasible, bootstrapping, you know. It, it, sequential detection. Yeah, it, 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 yeah, exactly. So it, it will cost. So maybe there uh, I just need asymptotic theory, you know, just to extract the information at some stage, right? Yeah, but, but what I'm uh, imagining is you start out with uh, you know, 
block of data, mm -hmm. assuming that it was sufficient, okay. in the end, it turns out to be insufficient. So, you, you know, you, you, you come back and you update your... Uh, yeah, but then here you are really focusing on the estimator itself. Okay, so you are saying that how can I improve my estimator getting new data, right? right. So I'm updating my estimator. So what I'm trying to answer here is what's the quality of my estimator? But if you're not, you're, you're not happy with that quality, yes. that measure of performance. Yeah, then if I have more data, it's even nicer, of course, yeah. It's luxury, luxury you know, I mean, it's more data, it's, it's all improves, yeah. But Any other questions? Well, if not, let's thank our Thank speaker. you very much. Thanks. Well, it's uh, one hour.